All right, good morning. Welcome to Equipping Hour. Yep, good morning. So glad that you're here. Come on in, find a seat, and uh, we'll get started here. Let me open us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it is a joy to gather with your people, those who have been uh, redeemed uh, out of this world, out of its system, out of its darkness, out of slavery, uh, into the freedom of grace, the reign of grace, and the glorious reality of belonging to you. Uh, We are somewhat aware of what we deserve, and we recognize we are not getting what we deserve, uh, but we are receiving grace upon grace. Lord, thank you for this morning and opportunity to uh, think through the lens of Scripture about current events. Uh, We ask that you'd be honored in all that we do here today. In Jesus' name, amen. On October 7th of this year, terrorists infiltrated the modern state of Israel. And they used technologies to get over walls, Uh, They used paragliders to fly into civilian places and they marched house to house and field to field slaughtering innocent civilians. Some 1,400 Israelis were killed. Uh, Nearly 300 were taken hostage. Uh, What we're going to do this morning is just talk a little bit uh, about the current war in Israel uh, to, to frame up the ways that we need to think about that biblically. And then we'll take some time for some questions and answers, Uh, maybe just questions. I don't know if we'll have answers. And uh, so you can be thinking about what you'd like to ask in a moment. Ben James has a microphone. He'll be uh, going around the room, and you'll have opportunity to ask the question you'd like to ask. And um, uh, Abby Martin is our stenographer today. She's going to be writing down the questions carefully. Uh, So if I misunderstand or don't get to something that was in your question, uh, we may be able to come back to it. Uh, I don't know how many Sunday mornings in equipping hour we'll do this. We'll see if you have zero questions. This will be a very short equipping hour. Uh, If we need to take more time next week, we can do that. Uh, What I want to finish with, if this becomes something of a series, is a biblical theology of Israel. We might call it an Israelology. Uh, How has God viewed Israel in the past? What is the state of Israel in the present? And what is Israel's future? And that will sort of kind of put the period on the whole thing in terms of God's perspective related to Israel. Uh, And so what we're going to do this morning, I want us to think about the current events. And and really, we drop into October 7th, 2023. Uh, We're not dropping into one isolated event. In fact, we're dropping into a whole stream of events that is the long train of world history. Really, October, 20, October 7th, 2023 is, is not new in terms of the hostilities in the Middle East. Uh, the nation, modern state of Israel is one Jewish nation in the heart of some 50 Arab and Muslim nation states in the region. And so that hostility goes back a long way. We might say all the way back to 2005 when Israel surrendered control of the Gaza Strip. Or maybe all the way back to, you just keep going backwards, 1973 Yom Kippur War, 1967 Six Days War, uh, 1956 and the Suez Crisis and the Sinai Campaign, or 1948, May 14th, in the establishment of the modern state of Israel, or all the way back to 1917, the Balfour Declaration, or the British Mandate where the the League of Nations gave Britain the, the... responsibility of establishing a, what they called a mandatory Palestine, uh, which would be a, a place that Jews would emigrate. Uh, the British, by the way, promised that land to several different people at the same time, creating all kinds of tensions and problems. So uh, this obviously goes back at least into the early 20th century, uh, back into the uh, uh, Herzl's early Zionism in the late 1800s. But of course, this goes back much farther than that. The the history of this conflict goes all the way back to Genesis 12. I mean, we're covering really the whole scope and sequence of human history played out in the Middle East. Uh, If we could bring up the region map, that'd be great. Thanks, Daniel. Many of you will likely know far more 
about the things we'll talk about in, in the coming weeks than I do. Uh, there are so many sort of trails of details and history uh, involving not only the broad scope of biblical history and world history, but 20th century history, uh, the Cold War, um, Arab-Israeli relationships, um, current affairs. You may have read biographies and histories of all of these things. Uh, you may be up on your military history and technology, and so I'm going to speak with um, sort of a, a hobbyist's interest in all of these areas, and uh, just know that my knowledge on this is very limited. I want to give us perspective, and, and I want to hear your hearts. Like, what do you think about when you read the news in the last six weeks? I want to know what's on your hearts, so that that will help direct our uh, discussion through the scriptures. And I want to begin with framing up what is potentially a very polarizing topic. My primary frame of reference for thinking about the war in Israel is the Bible. But my secondary frame of reference is world history from a Western perspective. I live in the West. I've only ever lived in the West. I think like a Westerner. Uh, I think like an American. And I think in terms of American policy and military history, uh, America's loyalties and allies, and those kinds of things. So just, I'm, this is a confession. I, I think the way I think because of uh, where I've lived. Those two things are related in some ways. Uh, the history of Western civilization and a biblical worldview. They're not identical, but, but they have intertwined in significant ways. Uh, they must also be unintertwined. They, they need to be distinguished in some ways. Uh, we can't just think that Western civilization equals biblical, um, and we shouldn't be led to think that Western civilization is opposed to a biblical worldview. They're not the same, but they do overlap. Just to give a little bit of perspective, I have a friend whose father was a Palestinian displaced by Israeli occupation. Just let that sink in for a little bit. You may have a friend whose father was displaced by Israeli occupation in the 20th century. Uh, there are people in our church of various uh, Arab descent uh, from various Middle Eastern countries. And so it's interesting, the, the ethnic loyalties, the, the lines of descent uh, create for us a very interesting perspective as Christians. Our fundamental loyalty is around the gospel, not around artificial nation states borders. Right? There is no Jew nor Gentile when it comes to our standing before the Lord in Christ through the gospel. The reality is uh, God has been gracious to outsiders by bringing us Christians into the rich root of the olive tree, which was God's promises to Israel. Uh, that being said, we're no different than any other sinner on the planet. And so we don't want to confuse um, ethnicity or background or heritage uh, in terms of priorities related to these things. I also have friends right now whose children are in the IDF fighting Hamas, the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, they've been called up, they're reservists, they are now on the front lines putting their lives in danger for the defense of their own homeland. So let that sink in just a little bit too. <laughs> if you've ever had friends on opposite sides of an international conflict, just understand what that does at the heart level. Uh, how do we think about these things? What truths transcend temporal conflicts? And we need to be mindful of those things. War is terrible. There's a day coming when war will be done. But that day is not until Jesus Christ reigns on the earth, when the swords will be turned into plowshares. That is, all the military industrial complex technology will be fashioned for the production benefit of the well-being of mankind. But that's not yet. There will be wars and rumors of wars until the end. It's important for us to understand, looking at current events, that there is no moral equivalence between Hamas and Israel, or between Hezbollah and Israel, or between Palestinian Islamic Jihad and Israel. 
these militant Islamic groups, which can be differentiated from Palestinian people, although sometimes those lines get fuzzy too, those militant Islamic groups are constitutionally and fundamentally opposed to the existence of Israel. They're not interested in a two-state solution. They never have been. And there are convictions that drive what they do and how they do it. They are not governed by international laws of warfare. They do not submit to the Geneva Conventions. They don't play fair, as it were. Again, war is terrible. Anytime somebody is killed, it is awful. And yet the laws of warfare that the radical Islamists use are fundamentally different than most of the nations of the world, and in particular, different than Israel. Israel has dropped leaflet, leaflets telling civilians, hey, we're going we're gonna to bomb this building, please leave now. They are intentionally not targeting civilians. And this has been true for most of Israel's modern history. Not all. There are some blemishes. But for most of Israel's modern history, they have sought to do everything they can to not target civilians. I just finished reading David Ben-Gurion's biography, and he made the point early on, early in the, in the history of the modern Israeli state. And let's pull up the map of Israel. Uh, next, uh, current map. Um, Ben-Gurion had seen reprisals done for civilian deaths across borders. Uh, the, the antagonism against Israel began the day before Israel was founded, May 14, 1948, as a modern state. Uh, that was the end of the uh, British uh, rule of the area of Palestine that began Israel's history, uh, modern history. The war began the day before they became a nation. They were unprepared militarily. Uh, a lot of things happened, skirmishes across borders uh, where uh, people shot up civilians, much like what we just saw on October 7th. And Israelis, farmers, and uh, versions of, of militias in Israel prior to the formation of the IDF uh, sought to give retribution and reprisals, and they too killed civilians. David Ben-Gurion, uh, he's like the George Washington of the modern state of Israel. He was prime minister twice. Uh, he's kind of like the founding father uh, of the modern state. He said, Israel's survival depends upon her security through strength and her righteousness. Now, don't think theological righteousness that comes through the gospel, Romans 1.16. Um, he meant we have to do things right because the whole world is watching. And if we commit civilian uh, reprisals for civilian atrocities, uh, we're going to get removed from the map. We will not be able to exist. And if we're not strong enough to defend ourselves, we will not be allowed to exist. In fact, all the wars in the modern state of Israel have been a fundamental attempt to remove them from existence. If you hear in the news today the idea of Israeli occupation, um, the, the solution to Israeli occupation by the hostile Arab world is the eradication of Israel. To them, occupation simply means existence. The fact that Israel exists means Israel occupies land that some of the Arab world, much of the Arab world, uh, doesn't want them to occupy at all. When you think about Israel, uh, they technically have probably the most legitimate land claim of any people on the planet, going all the way back to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. Um, and yet the, the history of that land is troubled. Here's what the jihadists are willing to do, the, the, those who uh, are operating as militants uh, of Hamas or Hezbollah uh, or um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. They are willing to kill civilians. They desire to kill civilians. In fact, a, a bounty among Hamas is placed upon the heads of Israeli civilians. A thousand dollar bounty per head was offered in some regions by city officials. Which is why you have pictures taken, GoPro footage taken, um, heads severed and brought out. 
It's because they are actually encouraged to do this very thing. It is considered an act of heroism to kill Jews. Not only are they willing to kill civilians, as opposed to what Israel is attempting to do, they are also willing to shield their military uh, establishment with their own civilians. They are eager for Jewish civilians to die. They are also willing for Palestinian civilians to die, which is why they place rocket launchers in schools and Boy Scout troops in hospitals under UN buildings. It is why they have their weapons caches uh, inside all of these safe havens. It is why they transport their soldiers with ambulances. They actually know that if there is a reprisal from Israel, we need to bomb that rocket launching site. Civilians may be killed. They want civilians to be killed. They use them intentionally as human shields. They desire to kill Israeli civilians. They're willing to to kill their own civilians, um, even killing those who were fleeing, um, trying to head southward after leaflets were dropped. Uh, Hamas armed men stopped Palestinians from fleeing south out of harm's way, sometimes beating them, sometimes shooting them. And then thirdly, not only do they desire to kill Jewish civilians, willing to have their own civilians killed, uh, they are willing to die themselves. And this is theological. Much like the, the end of, the, of World War II, when the Japanese populace worshipped the emperor as God on the earth, they were willing to give up their lives in sacrifice as worship to the emperor. Similarly, those who are committed to jihad, a holy war in Islam, believe that their death in such a war, either by blowing themselves up and taking civilians with them, or fighting in combat and perishing, or being used as a human shield in a hospital and dying, all of those are considered an instant ticket to heaven and heroism and martyrdom. I watched an interview with a, a mom. I believe she had 11 children and some 20 grandchildren. And, and this is a, a mom in Gaza who said, I want all of my children to be martyrs, to die for the cause, to free Palestine. And, and by that, she meant eliminate Israel from the map. And she was willing to sacrifice all her children and grandchildren to bring it about. So this is a fundamentally different view of life and the purpose of life, which results in a different kind of warfare uh, than than Israel. So in in terms of modern geopolitics, this puts a nation like Israel at a tremendous disadvantage. Uh, They have to work extra hard using different tactics uh, just to try to survive. So um, we need to think about this uh, with, with some perspective of not making the moral equivalence that our world wants to do today. Hey, there's two sides and they just can't seem to get along. Um, that's not the reality on the ground. Um, Arab Israelis are the freest Arabs in the Arab world. They get to practice Islam, they get full voting rights, they have full citizenship, they live in Israel under the best conditions anywhere in the Arab world. Those Uh, Arabs who want to live in Israel that call themselves Palestinians, they do not want Israeli citizenship, and they have as a constitutional desire the cessation of the existence of Israel. Uh, Those are two different perspectives, even among Muslims and Arabs that live in Israel. All right, that's an introduction. Uh, We'll get into some of the theology and some of the background kind of based on what's on your heart, what's on your mind. Uh, What questions do you have? Ben's got the microphone. Jan Stevenson over there has a question. I asked Ben to use discernment about who asks questions. That's a joke. I did ask him, but it was a joke. Okay. Can you explain why... The hatred of Jewish people is perpetuated for such a long time, even here in America, all over. Why is there such hatred towards Jewish people? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. Jan asks, why is there so much hatred toward the Jews? 
Um, we could go farther back. We could go to Genesis 3.15, and you remember that God made a promise to Eve. Actually, she, he, God made a promise to the snake, to Satan, uh, that from the woman would come a seed who would crush the head of the snake. Satan has been opposed to the offspring of the woman ever since Genesis 3. He tried to interfere with the seed line through murder and through other uh, uh, strategies through the early pages of Genesis. When you get to Genesis chapter 12, God makes a promise to Abram. Go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house, to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Okay, this is only good news. God makes a promise to a man after the scattering of nations. He's going to pick one family through whom he's going to be a blessing to the whole world. But in the meantime, there's going to be hostility. Some will bless Abram and his descendants, and some will curse him. And then God has a response to those blessings and cursings. Um, if you fast forward in the story, of, of course, you know, God promised Abraham a son. Uh, Abraham uh, thought he would bring about this promise in a way alternative to God's plan, Genesis 16. Sarah didn't conceive. Uh, Abraham went with Hagar, maidservant. By the way, in Islam, uh, she is Hagar. She is considered the, the promised wife, uh, the woman of blessing. Um, verse 11, the angel of Yahweh said to her, said to Hagar, Behold, you're with child, you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because Yahweh has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all his brothers." So here's God's promise regarding Hagar and her son Ishmael. Uh, Ishmael becomes the father of the Arab world. This is the beginning of the particular Middle Eastern hatred. Now what's behind all the other anti-Semitism in the world? You know, think World War II, think medieval Catholicism. Uh, Hitler didn't invent the pogroms, uh, by the way, or the yellow star on the arm. Uh, he borrowed all of that from medieval Catholicism. Why have the Jews been hated? despised, persecuted throughout history. Bottom line is, this is Satan's war against God's people. Um, but geopolitically, what is the, the current hatred that foments between the Arab and the Muslim world and Israel? Uh, this goes back all the way to Genesis. Um, look down at Genesis 25. And verse 13, these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in order of their birth. There was a daughter born first, um, and then here are the sons. Son number one, Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar. And then 10 others are listed. Uh, notice in verse 16, these are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages, by their camps, 12 princes according to their tribes. Did you know there were the 12 tribes of Ishmael in your Bible? Here they are. Now in the, the, era, in the uh, Muslim telling of this, ne uh, Nebaioth and Kedar, uh, the first two sons, uh, there's a debate within Islam uh, about from which of these two sons did Muhammad descend but the idea is Muhammad came from the first or the second sons of Ishmael. And the 12 tribes of Ishmael, according to Islam, are actually the 12 promised tribes. And Ishmael was actually the son that was to be taken up on the mountain and sacrificed, but the Lord substituted a goat for Ishmael. In other words, Ishmael was the promised son of Abraham. And Hagar was the, the, the promised mother of the 12 tribes. And these 12 tribes become the lineage of descent and promise for land and blessing and everything else. That's how the Islamic world takes these things. Of course, sometimes we're tempted to think Islamic, Islam is an ancient religion. 
Um, and it's not. It, it's, a, it's a fairly recent contrivance. Uh, we're talking end of the 7th century A.D. That means after the year of our Lord, after Christ. 700 years after the New Testament was finished, you have the birth and the expansion of Islam. Uh, so it, it's not the, an old ancient religion in competition with the Old Testament or the New Testament. It's an offshoot of those. In fact, Muhammad uh, knew and was aware of both Testaments uh, and the, the early practitioners of Islam were familiar with the stories of both Testaments um, and it is a corruption of those things. Uh, it doesn't predate them. But they take biblical data, trace a different story, trace a different land of promise. So... Um, Really, the, the genesis of this hostility goes about as far back as you can go in world history. And I, I think it is, uh, underneath it all, is the animosity of, of the enemy to God's people and his promise. Josh. Does what happened to the modern state of Israel today have eschatological implications? Okay, great question. No with an asterisk, okay? Here's what I mean. Uh, we, I'll, I'll rephrase your question just a little bit. Um, do, the, do the news events of this week fulfill biblical prophecy? The answer to that would be no. Um, in fact, um, this, this morning in main service, we're gonna be discussing the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord has not started yet. There are events biblically that get the day of the Lord started and none of these are those events. Uh, maybe a shoot-off question for that is, was 1948 a fulfillment of biblical prophecy? I would say, no, asterisk, maybe. And, and here's what I mean by the no, um, with an asterisk. Um, none of the events of the last six weeks are, are foretold in Scripture specifically. However, the present existence of a genetic people called Israel is a fulfillment of God's promise. In other words, Israel still exists. God has outstanding promises for the ethnic nation of Israel that still must come to pass if God has integrity. So if there were no Israel, if they'd been wiped off the map, uh, like the Philistines, there were no Philistines alive today, um, if Israel didn't exist, then God's promises would fail, fall apart, and you couldn't trust your Bible. We close our Bibles, walk away, it's all over. So in the sense that Israel still exists, it is a testimony to the fact that God keeps his promise and his timetable is still on his timetable. Um, in terms of fulfilling biblical prophecy, I do not believe these events nor the creation of the modern state of Israel in 1948 necessarily fulfill biblical prophecy. Unless, there, I have two, two um, passages in the Bible that detail um, Prior to or around leading up to the day of the Lord, uh, there is a regathering of Israel to the land. And then there are things that have to happen in Israel during the time of the day of the Lord. Um, so we could look in the rearview mirror after everything actually comes to pass and say, huh, in 1948, God did regather Israel to the land in preparation for those events. And then we might say, aha, that fulfilled a biblical prophecy. But I don't think we could say that yet because we don't know the times or the days. God could disperse Israel from the land tomorrow and keep them out of the land for another 10,000 years and God's word would not fail. So, no, but maybe. Is that fair? Okay, Raymond. Uh, three more rows up, Ben. There you go. Thank you. Uh, so you mentioned... <clears throat> The stories of Ishmael and how him and his mother were the appointed ones. Do, they, do their texts predate um, uh, the 700 or do they start? No, the, the Quran comes in the, in the 7th century, in the 600s. So that's where it starts, yep. that Hajar hey, hey, and Ishmael were the appointed ones. There's nothing predating that no, that they relied on. No, the on. biblical record of Hagar and Ishmael. Yeah. Um, but the corruption of that story for the version of Islam, uh, no, that's, that's really recent. That's okay. 600s AD. Okay, yeah. thank you. Wendy. <laughs> How are the other uh, Arab nations 
um, like what do you see them doing with okay. that's happening? Great question. Um, would you pull up a um, Sunni Shia relations chart? That one didn't work. There's nothing working. Everything except that one. Okay. This is the most important chart that I have available for you this morning. Um, yeah, the, the, the Arab, this is, this is complicated, right? So there are some 50 Arab Muslim states in the world. There's one Jewish state. Um, and, and you wonder, how, how do they all respond? Th throughout Israel's modern history, uh, there have been seasons where Israel has had alliances with various of the Arab states, and those have shifted and changed. It's not been monolithic. By the way, if you've ever taken a world history course, uh, you know that boundaries on nearly every continent have changed rapidly. Right? We're, we're used to seeing things just the way they are right now, and the map is as the map was. That's not true. <laughs> Uh, just watch the boundaries get rewritten over and over and over and over again. Same thing's true in the Arab world. Um, pull up the region map. Um, so these are the kind of the, the Middle East. Um, you have uh, Africa there is the bottom left, Asia to the top right, um, the Saudi Arabian Peninsula in the middle there. So in the, in the current war... Um, down, I didn't bring my red dot, but uh, Yemen is, is down at the bottom of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. That's the rust-colored deal in the middle there. Uh, the Houthis in Yemen are firing cruise missiles at Israel. Um, get us back to the Israel map. Apologies to the sound booth. You guys are going to work today. Okay. Um, you can see the Gaza Strip is the little tiny gray sliver at the bottom left on the Mediterranean coast of Israel. And then the West Bank is that gray blob in the middle. Um, and then um, Lebanon is on the north, Syria uh, on the northeast, and Jordan on the east. Um, they're all in different places but they have to answer to significant Muslim populations in their own countries. This is challenging. Uh, this is challenging for every single one of them. So you have uh, Yemen, uh, whose government is trying to be non-committal, but the Houthis, who are backed by Iran, are sending cruise missiles at Israel. And the U.S. is shooting them down, and Saudi Arabia is shooting them down. Why would Saudi Arabia be shooting down Yemeni rockets? Um, because in one sense, they're protecting their own interests, but they can't do it too loudly because they can't be seen as uh, on the side of Israel right now. That's tough. Uh, Jordan to the east, um, they're, they're a, a, a Muslim country, but they have a monarchy. And the monarchy is a minority Muslim sect within the bigger piece of Jordan. And so they have to dance carefully. Um, this is, that's why they, they won't accept uh, Palestinian refugees. Uh, and then you've got Egypt down there on the bottom left. Um, they refuse to let uh, Gaza, refugees from Gaza into Egypt. In fact, the Egyptian prime minister uh, two weeks ago said, we will do everything in our power to keep our border tight and not let Hamas into Egypt. They're opposed to Hamas. In fact, uh, years ago, Israel tried to give the Gaza Strip to Egypt and Egypt refused. And, and it's stunning because when you think about the Golan Heights, the West Bank, or the Gaza Strip, all of these things make sort of Swiss cheese out of the modern state of Israel and make Israel really vulnerable. Israel's about the size of New Jersey and it's really skinny in some parts. You can see it could very easily be cut off militarily. It's just vulnerable. Um, go to a map called Region 2. And you'll see in this map just how small Israel is in relationship to its uh, neighbors. Uh, those cutouts there are under Palestinian rule, under Palestinian authority. Um, it, the the Gaza Strip, West Bank, Golan Heights uh, were turned over uh, to the Palestinians uh, so that they could rule them autonomously. 
Um, and it just means Israel's vulnerable. That's where rocket attacks on civilians come from. Uh, well, okay, you, you want Palestinian territory? We'll let you have the areas that you want. And, and what happens out of those things? Um, rockets are fired, suicide bombers come out. Nothing new there in 1956 uh, with the Suez crisis. The Fedayeen out of Egypt were suicide bombers that crossed the Egyptian border into Israel uh, and tried to, to blow up Israeli civilians. But, but now the Egyptians are against Hamas. Well, why does all this happen? This again goes back really far in Islamic history. All the way back to Muhammad's day, there was a, a, a religious civil war in Islam between Sunni and Shia. The Shiites uh, were convinced that the line of descent for authority in Islam should come through the bloodline of Muhammad. But the Sunni were convinced that the authority in Islam should come through the way of Muhammad, not his bloodline. So they wanted a fidelity theologically, not a fidelity genetically to, to Muhammad, to the prophet Muhammad. So um, ever since then, oh, there we go. Uh, ever since then, um, you have a fight between Sunni and Shia Muslims. Okay, I told you it was the most important chart you'll ever see. Now you're doubting that, now that you've seen it. <clears throat> what you have here is... Um, uh, Islam, the, the big circle in the middle, is intended to just represent the whole thing. These are the, the various religious sects or groupings within Islam. The biggest circle there off to the left is Sunni. Okay? And, and the Sunni Muslims, are, are uh, these are broad categories here, but Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Algeria, Morocco, Sudan, um, Syria, uh, Iraq, Turkey, Pakistan, Indonesia, Egypt, those are all um, majority or significant population Sunni Muslims. The Shia, much smaller circle over there to the right, um, that is Iran. You know, the Iran uh, is headed by the Ayatollah and the Mullahs, that is the clerics and religious teachers. They said, we can't practice Islam unless the religious teachers are the, the rulers of the land politically. It's the only way we can be faithful. So Shia hate Sunni, and Sunni hate Shia, and they've been at war. Essentially, that's what the Iran-Iraq war was over, uh, when they fought each other. Uh, that was a, a battle within Islam over religion and politics, really a battle over authority and power. So inside a country like Jordan, you have a significant Shia population, but Jordan has a king. And the Shia are opposed to somebody being king. Why? Because they believe the religious leaders need to be in charge. And so they hate each other. What's fascinating about what's going on right now is that Iran is backing uh, Hamas. Iran is Shia, Hamas is Sunni. Iran is also backing Hezbollah, which is firing rockets out of southern Lebanon into Israel. Uh, by the way, Israel has not attacked southern Lebanon. Uh, they've been firing back at, at military targets from the Hezbollah. Um, but Iran's backing both parties. And, and if they were in the same plot of land, they'd fight each other to the death. But they're both taking money from Iran. Um, Iran is also supporting the Houthis in, in Yemen. And, and what's interesting in all of this is the, the Sunni um, Muslims of Hamas in Israel are affiliated with Islamic Brotherhood, which is Sunni, and is fundamentally opposed to any Arab monarchy, which is why Egypt won't let them into Egypt, which is why Jordan won't let them into Jordan. Because if you let in a bunch of people that are fundamentally opposed to you being king, you foment a, a revolt and a rebellion against your own administration. Um, so they're like, nope, stay there. And of course, Israel can't have them stay there because they just keep firing on the civilian population. Uh, it creates a dilemma. I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> There's a, a lot of conflict. How do I put this? Uh, as long as Israel exists, they basically want to destroy them. Because I have family all the way from my mom's side, which was all the way back to Spain. Like, if you tested my mother's blood, 99.99% Spain. And, we, and I understand at the time that the Yuma dynasty in the 900s, 
thousands took over Spain and it was Islamic leadership but Jewish merchants people living that lifestyle so it's as long as they don't own Israel then they're okay with having Jewish servants in yep. one sense uh, some kind of depends uh, some in Islam would like the complete eradication of all Jews from the face of the earth it was interesting, after the uh, Balfour Declaration, there was a proposal put forward that uh, Jews around the world could have a homeland and they were going to put it in Africa. Let's just carve out a, a circle of ground in Africa and let's put them there. Um, of course, they protested and they said, no, actually, Israel is historically our home. Um, but you're right, that, that hostility will not end. Um, it, it's not going to end until uh, Jesus solves these things or... Um, Islam as a religion and worldview uh, somehow goes away by some other means. Nick, over here. This gets to the, maybe some of the big picture of radical Islamic strategy. Maybe this is the question you were gonna ask, so I'll answer it, and if it's not, you can ask a different one. Well, who is a Palestinian and who is not? Okay, great. Who is Palestine? Yeah. Great question. Um, don't let me forget, Ben. I'm going to answer Nick's question now, and then I'm going to go to big picture strategy. Okay, so ask me that question in case I get rabbit trailed and forget. Okay. Um, what is a Palestinian is a really good question. Okay. Risk of stepping on lots of toes here. Okay. Um, the, the word was coined in the second century AD by the Romans after the Bar Kokhba revolt. So, uh, you know, in, in um, New Testament history, uh, you, you had the zealots in Israel. Those are the guys with the little uh, swords, short swords that were going around and assassinating loyalists to Rome, assassinating uh, Roman officials and that kind of thing. Uh, they wanted to bring about an uprising, uh, kind of like the intertestamental uprising of the Maccabean revolt. Uh, they wanted to overthrow the Romans, get rid of the overlords, and have control of their own land, be in control of their own destiny. Um, of course, at the, the time of Christ, um, that, that uh, war uh, was still going, but underneath, in A.D. 70, Titus Vespasian, the Roman general, plowed through Jerusalem, destroyed the city, demolished the temple, threw all the blocks of the temple off of the Temple Mount uh, down onto the ground below. Um, and, and the temple was no more, sacrifices were no more. That was 70 AD. In the second century, early 100s AD, the Jews revolted again. Um, and you can read about the history of Masada and the sort of last stands of the Jews against the Romans. Um, but the Romans decided, no more. We're tired of these guys. We're going to eradicate them. We're going to eliminate these people uh, forever um, so they don't cause us any more problems. This was the Roman version of peace, right? When you read the description of the Roman Empire in Daniel 2 or Daniel 7, uh, this is that, that rolling mighty beast that nobody could stop, uh, an iron monster. Uh, this is exactly what Rome did. And they said, so no more Judaism, no more Jews. And they renamed the land of Israel in the second century as an insult to Israel. They named it Philistia. That's where we get the word Palestine from. Uh, this was a, a, a Roman word describing the land of Israel. Now, why did the Romans want to call it Palestine? Well, why did they throw that name out there? Because of the Philistines, you can feel the relationship between those words. Um, the, the Philistines hadn't existed for 400, well, by that time, 530 years or so. The, the, the Philistines had gone out of existence as a people altogether. There, there's no more record of them after about 400 BC. And so, uh, of course, the Philistines weren't from around there either. The Philistines were an Aegean people from the Aegean Sea, upper northeast part of the Mediterranean. Um, they were a seafaring people, uh, more closely related to the Greeks, who sailed down and they found this strip of land on the coast of the Mediterranean where Israel is now, and they settled there. That's why the, the land of the Philistines is the coastal plain uh, leading up to the foothills of Israel. So that was Philistia. You hear about the Philistines when, uh, you know, the conquest uh, time period, and then David fought the Philistines. But there's no more Philistines by 400 B.C., 
the Romans wanted to insult Israel and say, we're calling this Philistia or Palestine. So ever since then, on and off, it's been called the land of Palestine. But nobody there today is a Palestinian in the strict historical sense. And yet, uh, the, the UN, Israel itself, all the nations regularly call the Arabs who want to live there Palestinians. So I think we have to be okay with the label. But understanding the history, it's not as if the, the Arab claim on the land is some historical thing that goes way back. It, it's, a, it's a more recent historical claim, right? If, if you were a, uh, an Arab, a, a Bedouin, a nomad, maybe a Jordanian or an Egyptian, and you lived in that land, um, and then got displaced when Israel came. You, you have a land claim. Um, it's just more of recent history. Um, let me mention briefly <clears throat> why violence, why, why extremism, what is the big picture plan um, in jihadist Islam? Um, why do suicide bombers walk into a pizza place and blow themselves up hoping to take as many civilians as they can? Um, why, why do Hamas and Hezbollah and PIJ, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, why do they uh, launch unguided missiles into civilian populations? I mean, most of them don't hit anything. They're, they're, it's, it's not uh, efficient weaponry. Um, it's intended to provoke terror on the one hand, but I believe it's intended to provoke something else. Uh, the idea behind terrorism is to provoke a response from Israel that is disproportionate to the attack. If we launch a rocket and it lands in a, in a, in a cornfield and doesn't hurt anybody, and Israel launches a guided missile back and blows up the rocket launcher and, and maybe an apartment building next to it, um, then Hamas can say, hey, they're attacking civilians, right? They, they want the narrative related to a motive that Israel has either to, to occupy, dominate, kill civilians, that kind of thing. But, but more than just a PR campaign, the terrorists are designing an, a disproportionate response from Israel and from the West for a very specific purpose. And this goes back to understanding what Islam is. 10% of Islam according to some studies, would consider itself jihadist or radical. Uh, the, the, these would be the kind of guys who planned the September 11th attacks on the United States. Uh, this would be Hezbollah. Uh, this would be the Houthi rebels, uh, the, these kinds of things. These are the people that are willing to kill civilians, kill themselves, uh, use civilians and shields for the big picture. Um, that's, that's probably 10% of Islam. You have another 10% of Islam that is completely and totally secular, right? It, it's like um, maybe the, the uh, equation to that is, I was born in America, therefore I'm a Christian, right? Um, I, I don't love Christ, I don't go to church, I don't read my Bible, but this is sort of a Christian place, so yeah, that's my affiliation. But I live for myself, I live for the world, I just want to uh, eat, drink, and be merry, right? That's another 10% of Islam, totally secular Islam. Uh, in between, the 80% or so left uh, might be considered moderate Islam. Now, one of the tenets, fundamental tenets of Islam, is the doctrine of jihad. And it is one of the five pillars of the religion of Islam. Every Muslim must participate in jihad by Quranic law. Now, when is the debate? When must a Muslim participate in jihad? Um, and there's theological debate about this. Uh, the, the, on the extreme end, you have people that say, anytime a Muslim is killed by an infidel, the Muslim world must unite in jihad. Okay? And about 10% of the Muslim world buys into that theory. A Muslim got killed by someone who's not a Muslim? Blood vengeance. That's holy war. It's actually required by God. That's a, that's a minority view. The, the secular view, leave out for a second, but that 80% in the middle, moderate Islam, their requirements for jihad are a little bit more specific. And, and the general idea is if an Islamic nation is threatened or harmed by an infidel nation, or if Islam itself is threatened by infidels, 
by the unfaithful, um, then every Muslim in the world is obligated by the Quran to participate in jihad. Okay? What does that mean? Every Muslim uh, believes that, I need to be careful saying every Muslim, you're gonna go meet a Muslim and ask him, do you believe this? He's gonna say, no, I don't believe that. Um, Muslim doctrine is this. Um, worldwide jihad will bring about the Muslim rule of the earth under the last imam, the last teacher. And the last teacher of Islam is Messiah. They call him Messiah and they believe it is Jesus. Like the Jesus we know in the Bible. They believe he will come back and he will establish Quranic law and Islamic rule over the face of the earth. And the thing that will bring that to, to, to happen is the global jihad that will usher in the new golden age of Islam and world domination. Um, it, it's a fascinating read on eschatology. Islamic eschatology is just the reverse of our eschatology. Our Antichrist is their Messiah. Our Messiah is actually their Antichrist. It's an interesting mirror image. So the, the strategy for the, for the radicals is how do I unite the Islamic world? This was the purpose of the September 11th attacks back in 2001. We're going to fly buildings into the World Trade Center, uh, into um, the Pentagon. Uh, they were aiming for the White House. This is in their blueprints. Uh, they originally had plans to aim at West Coast targets, realized there's not enough fuel to make a big fire to take down a building. Um, so they stuck to the East Coast, but they were aiming at the White House. And they wanted to provoke a United States response to that attack knowing that that response would be disproportionate. If the United States went and attacked a Muslim country in response to September 11th, that would demand the moderate Islamic world to join in global jihad against the West. You may have heard the Ayatollahs in Iran describe Israel as the little Satan. Who do they describe as the great Satan? The United States. So, uh, the, the, what, is the, what is the big picture plan? Um, just do something that's going to irritate the West or irritate Israel or irritate the United States so that they respond. And maybe they'll respond in a big enough way that the entire Arab world and the entire Muslim world, the Muslim world includes many more than Arabs, um, in, a, in a global war against the West that will bring in the end times for them. So, uh, it's, a, it's a particular strategy. We might think, well, what's the military benefit? It, it's not really a military benefit when, when um, Hamas in the Gaza Strip takes all the, the water pipes that the West sends them for humanitarian aid and turns them into rockets and sends them willy-nilly into the air hoping they hit something. That's not great military strategy. And, and they're going to get beat. They're going to get beat uh, big time by Israel. Um, but, but that's not their end game. Their end game is the end times, uh, uniting Islam against the West. What else? Jan, go ahead. You're close, and then we'll go over to Diana. Only two, you only get two questions, Jan. <laughs> not going to happen. Uh, what is the difference between Hamas and Hezbollah? Hamas is Sunni, Hezbollah is Shiite. Um, they don't like each other, uh, but they have a common enemy right now. And, and the thought is that Hezbollah fighting out of southern Lebanon um, actually has a strategic advantage if Israel's distracted in the south in the Gaza Strip. Did that answer your question? Okay, Dana. Remind us where God is in all of this. Well, I never thought you'd ask. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 11. And, and we'll get into this <clears throat> in detail when we look at Israelology. <clears throat> Big picture, Israel still exists as a distinct ethnic, linguistic, cultural people. That is miraculous. Providential, supernatural, in keeping with God's plan. It's just amazing, frankly. Uh, read the history of the Six Days War, the War of Independence, uh, the, the, the Sinai uh, campaign, uh, or, or any of them, the Yom Kippur War, um, and, and the fact that Israel still exists after everything that happened in the 20th century. Go back a little farther to the Holocaust and uh, Hitler's designs. Um, 
God is, is all over this in his providence. Um, we have to understand the, the nature of the modern state of Israel, I think, to understand what's said here in Romans eleven twenty eight. This is key for us in understanding. This is going to get us to how we think about this through the lens of the gospel, how we even think about this through the lens of, of politics. From the standpoint of the gospel, Paul writes, they, meaning Israel, ethnic Israel, they are enemies for your sake. The your there is the church. Israel is enemies of the church from the standpoint of the gospel. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they, same they, Israel, are beloved for the sake of the fathers. How can God love somebody that's an enemy of the gospel? <laughs> I was an enemy of the gospel at one point, and God loved me. God's gonna keep his promises, not only to curse Israel for their disobedience, their present state of Israel is apostate, they are cut off for their unbelief, lying like branches of a natural olive tree on the ground, they're not benefiting from the spiritual rich root of the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob other than the fact that they still exist. In fact, the present state of, of Israel is awful. Uh, Tel Aviv is, is kind of a, uh, a hot spot for, uh, can I put it this way, immorality tourism. It's just decadent and perverse. Having rejected the gospel, the, the, the people in the modern state of Israel, for the most part, they, they are God-haters. And if you go to Israel, you will see the outward prayers and the religious ceremonies and the garb and, 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 a, and an army of people in the street marching up and down, yelling at bus drivers, Shabbat, Shabbat, meaning don't drive on the Sabbath. And they're doing more work trying to prevent the guy from working. It's, it's, it's empty, it's hypocritical, it's spiritually dead. Israel is not the beneficiary of promises of peace and safety right now. Listen, Hezbollah could win. The, 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 the Iranians could fire a nuke and, and Israel could be dispersed. There's no guarantee they get to stay in the land right now, not from God. Uh, they, they are disobedient to the gospel. At the same time, um, there are remarkable groups that are actively sharing the gospel with Jews in Israel and having amazing inroads. I'd encourage you to do some of the research on that. You can watch Living Waters or Way of the Master and, and those guys are doing evangelism in Israel, in Hebrew, with Jews who are coming to faith. It's, it's really stunning. But the nation as a whole is not in a place of belief and they will not be the beneficiaries of God's promises ultimately of military security and, and physical blessing and prosperity until Jesus comes personally, as we talked about last week in the main service, to confront them over their unbelief, to purge them in their apostasy, to bring the nation to faith, and then to protect them from their military enemies and usher in their glorious future. That's still all to come. And um, that will help us sort of think ahead uh, to our time, either next week or the week to come. If you have questions that come to mind related to current events in Israel, the war now, biblical prophecy, um, or, or just the theology of Israel, um, let me encourage you to uh, send those to me via text or email. Uh, you, you have my phone number. If you don't go to Grace Bible Church, don't, don't email me a question about Israel. <laughs> if you go to Grace Bible Church, uh, you know, include your name and uh, just send that to me by phone or by email. And um, if a lot of those come in this week after what we've talked about this morning, uh, we may take up some more um, and then we'll get into our Israelology together. Let me close in prayer. God, thank you for this morning. Uh, we thank you that you are faithful to you, faithful to judge, faithful to bless. You will keep your promises. Uh, you will not let sins go unpunished, and yet you are merciful. Lord, we're the beneficiaries of all of these things. Uh, we really stand amazed that we get to be a part of your gracious plan to redeem sinners from every tongue and tribe and nation. Lord, we do pray for the peace of Israel. Uh, we pray that your kingdom would come 
And we know that those two things will go hand in hand when you yourself return and reign as king. And we thank you for today in Jesus' name. Amen.